episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, uh, everybody, again to another episode with another really fascinating guest for you today, helping to create a better tomorrow on many different fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Ashley Lorenz, who uh, is Vice President, uh, Distinguished Scientist, and Managing Director of Microsoft Research Outreach. Uh, and it is there where he leads their global team to ultimately amplify the impact of research that's done at Microsoft uh, and to advance the cause of science and technology research around the world. Uh, his team is responsible for driving both strategy and execution of Microsoft research engagement with the rest of Microsoft and the broader scientific uh, and technology communities. And they invest in a variety of uh, high impact collaborative research projects on behalf of the company, uh, creating pipelines uh, for world-class talent and ultimately generating awareness uh, of a variety of really fascinating future science and, and technology uh, programs. Uh, prior to joining Microsoft, uh, Mr. Loren served as the founding chief of the Intelligence Systems Center at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, where he directed R&D uh, in artificial intelligence, robotics, neuroscience, uh, and created APL's first enterprise-wide AI strategy and technology roadmap. Uh, he was there for two decades and led their interdisciplinary teams uh, in developing novel AI tech from concept to real world applications uh, with a focus on autonomous systems. Uh, he has a background in machine learning and signal processing and his current research interests uh, there included uh, reinforcement learning for real world systems, machine decision making under uncertainty, human machine teaming and practical AI safety. Uh, he is a subject matter on a broad range of topics, including AI and autonomous systems, has served on advisory boards and strategic study groups for the U.S. Department of Defense, Department of Energy, National Academy of Sciences, and was recently nominated by the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy to serve as an AI expert uh, on the Global Partnership on AI and was elected to serve as the science representative on its inaugural steering committee. Uh, he, Mr. Lawrence has a background, both Bachelor of Science and Master of Science from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and, and alongside all of that he was doing in the engineering space. Uh, he also has a parallel career as a, a hip hop artist uh, known by his name as Solstice. Uh, he founded uh, the group Wandering Soul Records and he serves as a voting member of the Recording Academy, the institute uh, that organizes the Grammy Awards. So a lot of fascinating things to talk about here. Uh, Ashley Lorenz, thank you so much for taking the time to, to come on the show today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'd uh, like to, as we typically do, start off by uh, sort of handing things over to you for a little bit, just to, to talk about the beginning, uh, everything from uh, where you grew up to uh, how you developed some of your early uh, interest in uh, STEM fields, uh, like uh, AI and autonomous systems. I think that'd be a great way to, to start things off. Yeah, happy to. So I am uh, born and raised on the south side, south suburbs of Chicago, um, you know, I've always had a parallel interest in science and technology and just kind of an intellectual curiosity for how the world works. So that's, that's driven me. Uh, I've also um, always been interested in expression and creativity and connection, connecting people through art. And, uh, and so that, that's been a driver as well. And I would say, you know, just based on, uh, my own kind of experiences growing up, I'd actually focused more on science and technology almost as the thing that I was going to do as a, as a passion, <laughs> uh, you know, and, uh, and my primary goal at the beginning was to focus on uh, kind of a career in music. Uh, just that was the way that my mentality was. And, you know, it, it just turned out that this fallback option <laughs> that I was pursuing, you know, in science and technology and engineering led me to go to the school that was in my backyard, you know, two hours uh, to the south of my house, which was the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And so I wound up getting a bachelor's and a master's degree there uh, in ECE, electrical computer engineering. Just so happens that the in-state school is one of the top <laughs> engineering <laughs> schools. And I wound up, uh, you know, ultimately finding my way to Johns Hopkins APL and, and, and by way of those experiences, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics, which just uh, I found fascinating. And I also found that my own uh, sense of agency, my own sense of who I was and how I wanted to contribute to society was compatible 
with a career in science and technology and research and innovation, much more so than I thought at the beginning. And so while I was continuing to pursue my music career, uh, I was also just discovering myself as a, as a professional uh, in science and technology. And, you know, that's led to a lot of the adventures, uh, you know, achievements or however you want to, to say it, uh, you know, that you read at the beginning. So I just feel really fortunate to, to have had these opportunities. Outstanding. Outstanding. And, you know, it's, it's like, I, um, I don't know if I tell you, I'll tell you offline, but, you know, one of the, um, one of my friends uh, growing up in high school actually founded the Source magazine. And um, I was, you know, in, in his friend group. So it was around, I'm, I'm, I'm about 10 years on you, uh, but sort of remember the, the early days of hip hop and you were born in 1979. So you were born right about the time sort of hip hop was emerging from sort of the stuff that came before electronica and, and so forth. And then as you, you know, you grew up and you uh, started creating your own music, um, sort of old school disappeared, the new age stuff came in, uh, and then you defined a lot of what you did in, in the, in the hip-hop brain is alternative hip-hop. Um, talk a little bit about what that is in terms of sort of the, uh, the spectrum that has happened since hip-hop first, you know, came on the scene in the late 1970s. You know, for me, hip-hop was a way of... Um, expressing myself and who I was, and in a way, discovering myself and my personal narrative at a time in my life where uh, I wasn't necessarily empowered in a lot of different ways, but I could control the stories that I told about myself mm -hmm. and I could, uh, you know, kind of let the no world know who I was and what I was about. So for me, it's always been centrally about that. I think the other thing that's fascinating about hip hop is the way that maybe even more so than, than some other genres, it just situates all those personal narratives. It, at the, it's hard about personal narratives, but it situates in this cultural context, in this societal context, and it becomes um, a sort of group discussion, a group conversation uh, among people that practice the art you know, of hip hop, of expression in that way, and among the culture that surrounds it, all the other kinds of creative uh, you know, expression that surrounds it, like all the, the elements of dancing and, you know, break dancing in particular and yep. elements of visual art, graphical art, graffiti and, and those kinds of things. Uh, other, other sources of, of musical expression like DJing um, and even, you, you know, over time, uh, you know, mixtures of, of hip hop in different forms. So, so for me, it's always centrally been about that, you know, personal narrative situated in this context, this group dialogue, this group discussion. And of course, all of that uh, cultural context or a lot of it centers in um, kind of the black and brown communities of, of uh, you know, the United States. And, 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 and another, you know, kind of fascinating aspect is having the ability to kind of go overseas uh, and, and see your own culture as seen through the eyes of others, uh, you know, other cultures and, uh, and other uh, societies. And in some ways to go and be an ambassador for American culture in these aspects of American culture overseas. So this is a roundabout way of getting back to your question, but I, I never really, the, the, the central pursuit was never to me about the commercialization of the art form. Obviously, mm -hmm. if you want to do something you're passionate about, um, it helps if that can also be an economically viable pursuit. <laughs> right. So, so, so then that's where some of those other questions come into play, which is how do you monetize something that you're passionate about so that yeah. you can do more of it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that led me on a whole parallel journey um, with respect to the music of being, you know, an entrepreneur yeah. and un trying to understand how the music can support an aspect of, of, of what I was doing. And that's when you have to start to worry about, again, the commercial viability of it. How do you plug in uh, to these economic systems that you can generate some prosperity along with the economic, along with the creative expression. Um, earlier in, in my own experience with music, it was less amenable to doing a lot of, to, to the DIY kinds of things that you have at your disposal now. You know, it, in present day, and this became true maybe about midway through my music career. In present day, you don't need anybody for anything, <laughs> really. Uh, you know, you can go and you can get equipment that's inexpensive and you can have the world's best digital audio workstations at your fingertips for 
not very much money. You don't have to go to a recording studio. You can publish your music, right, to people that may want to consume it. Now you have a, a crowded field that you have to take advantage. You have to stand out in some kind of way. You have to. Maybe it's a little diff more difficult to find your audience because you're competing with more people uh, that can access uh, this form uh, uh, in a you know in, in kind of a, a, a viable way. So you know, but 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 earlier before that, you had to worry a little bit more about the business, the business of music. And, and then, you know, there are certain gatekeepers <laughs> and, and things that you had to try to understand how to navigate. If you wanted lots of people to hear your music, you had to figure out how to get on the radio, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, in different forms. Could be college radio, which I focused a lot on, uh, or, um, you know, could be commercial radio, which I have had some, you know, uh, success with. I, success is too strong a word. My music's been played on commercial radio before, but in very limited kind of ways. But again, there's a lot of, um, you know, payola and things that kind of go in or having the right connections that have traditionally gone into that kind of exposure sure. or getting your, getting your uh, music pressed on vinyl was a big thing because then sure. you could get it to DJs. Yep. And that was another way of accessing, uh, you know, potential fans of your music. So a lot of my early music, I pressed on vinyl and that got it in, into the hands of DJs and college radio uh, kind of DJs overseas and in, mm -hmm. in the U S so um, I, I never really, uh, I was always intent on kind of figuring a lot of that stuff out for myself. I never wanted to wait for the quote unquote big break or the right. record deal. Not, none of that ever made sense to me. Probably I also had this fallback option <laughs> <laughs> of, of science and technology. And also um, over the course of my career, uh, having that, having that uh, side career in, mm -hmm. in uh, you know, in science and technology meant that I could I could finance some of the things for myself. So, yeah. um, you know, so, so anyway, that's a kind of a roundabout way of answering your question. But um, if you did not have that kind of agency or that kind of uh, ability to self-finance in those things, and you're yeah. really at the whims of, you know, the, the, the big commercial enterprise, which, which was tough to navigate. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Well, so you, you, you have this, um, this wonderful career as a hip hop artist, you finish your uh, graduate work uh, and you show up at Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Laboratory. And, and we had um, a couple months ago, we had uh, Julie Marble on from the, the Human Autonomy uh, Group uh, talking a little about it. But really, um, uh, the Applied Physics Lab, really what I'll, I'll refer to as bleeding edge stuff and, and the things that you're involved in, in terms of intelligent systems, autonomous systems, neuroscience, really, uh, really on the bleeding edge. Um, you've worked on uh, humanoid robots, uh, drones. Um, when I read about programs like this that are, that are so advanced, I love to ask the question about sort of what your typical day was like, uh, you know, showing up at, at the lab and deciding what to work. I mean, how do you decide what to work on? Where did your orders come from? And, and what were the things that you were most passionate about? Because I know you had NASA and the Defense Department and all sorts of other people that uh, were asking you to do stuff. Uh, talk a little bit about your experiences there over those two decades. Yeah, I mean, just so just like with uh, music and using creativity to kind of connect people and to improve, uh, you know, the, I'll say broadly speaking, the human experience. That's what's always motivated me in technology as well. And that's where I found uh, in advancing technology through research, I could scratch that itch, <laughs> you know, and satisfy that same need. So, you know, in thinking about the course of my career, one of the things that I've always thought about is how technology can help improve people's experience. Um, you know, and that's gone from early days in my career where I think where I thought a lot about Navy operators and their experiences, uh, you know, trying to do a very tough job and how technology could help, um, you know, ultimately towards, uh, you know, security, uh, you know, greater security, or maybe even could be life-saving technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, that expanded uh, more to different kinds of applications, um, thinking about national security and, and, and related. Later in my career, I started to focus a little bit more on um, a broader set of applications, you know, going uh, to even, for example, you know, robotic prosthetics was something that we did in my, my laboratory yep. uh, or our laboratory, you know, the, the, the intelligent system center. So, so for me, it was always about thinking about the impact of the work, how you help people from individuals trying to do a job uh, or a task that's challenging, that technology can make that a little bit easier. 
um, to, you know, even restoring people's function through, you know, uh, you know, cognitive aids or, you know, even the prosthetics example that I gave to thinking now, and this is, you know, kind of fast forwarding a little bit, but thinking about the, you know, that global view, you know, mm -hmm. humanity as a planetary species and how technology that we use every day can kind of help us, I'll say, behave intelligently as a, as a species together. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to behave intelligently to think about the most pressing challenges, you know, that face us, you know, as a planetary species and how we bring technology to bear on that. And so that's, that's what's always driven me. And what that, what that translates to in terms of an everyday experience is that every day is different. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I always like to explore right on the frontier again. So every day is different. And you're really thinking about helping other people understand how technology can help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, creating, creating those opportunities. And then once they kind of get to a point where, uh, you know, you can start to define a plan, uh, you know, kind of moving forward. That's why I like to build a structure around it. And then for me personally, move on to the next, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the next frontier. Sure. Uh, you know, at Johns Hopkins, the APL and the, in the, uh, in the intelligence system center, you know, just kind of walking in was always inspiring to me. We always <laughs> had like a computer vision demo running at the beginning. So you're seeing machine learning happening. You've got, you know, the robotic prosthetics example, you know, uh, kind of technology at work. You've got people working on, um, you know, autonomous aerial vehicles or other kinds of autonomous robotic platforms. Um, and that's just on the way to your desk. <laughs> right. Uh, and then and then you sit down and the, and, the, and the fun begins. And so, you know, I've just recently uh, translated over now to Microsoft Research mm -hmm. and just trying to get a sense of place. It's a little interesting because it's, um, you know, we're still in the midst of the pandemic now. Sure. And so Microsoft Research, you know, my equivalent experience is happening in Building 99. Um, and it's, it's this really impressive building, a big atrium, uh, you, you know, a room for hundreds of people and scientists and uh, engineers and all. And it's, it's quite empty, but I've been starting to come in, uh, you know, get the sense of what I experienced kind of on my way to my desk, uh, which I know will continue to evolve, you know, as we kind of progress through the stages of the pandemic. Very cool. Very cool. And, and, and in that, so now, okay, so a couple decades at APL, now you show up at Microsoft, uh, one of the most valuable, largest companies in the world. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, we, we had some Microsoft guests on in the past, like Jim Weinstein working in the healthcare space. And I think most, most of you out there know that Microsoft is not just, you know, operating systems anymore. You do a lot more. Talk about this new role, if you could, uh, what, what is involved in, uh, because it seems like you're at the epicenter of, of a lot of stuff that goes on in, in the research organization. Uh, talk us to about uh, your transition to this position and, and, and what, and basically what you do on a, on a given day here now. Yeah. Well, one of the things that um, I'm really excited about for Microsoft is this, this mission of empowerment. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's right there uh, in the mission for the company. You empower, uh, you know, essentially leverage technology to empower people and, and collections of people, organizations, institutions, uh, you know, even societies, you know, to kind of, to kind of do more as the mission. And um, to be in research, you know, at a place like that, that's itself at the forefront of technology. And then you're in research, which is looking, you know, beyond the headlights to what's coming next. And, and Microsoft is really about, you know, building tools and platforms, you know, for people to go create. So again, empowering people. But in research now, you're envisioning what those next challenges are, uh, right, that people will be trying to tackle. And then how technology can really uh, be extended, be pushed, uh, how the boundaries, you know, of te what technology is today can be pushed to address those use cases coming up. So it's, it's really uh, exciting, you know, from, to go from the space of um, uh, kind of national security, you know, space exploration, et cetera, uh, it, technologies that themselves are addressing, addressing big societal problems to you know, uh, more of the uh, private sector you know, with Microsoft, really thinking about technologies that people are using every day uh, and how they might be using those to kind of solve problems. So that's really at the, at the foundation uh, of, what, uh, of what we're about. Um, and so you get this view, you start to you know, zoom out a little bit and, and start to think about you know, society itself as a customer for technology and how you organize around that challenge. So that's been uh, a focus in the early days in this new uh, in this new role, 
you know, as a vice president in research, really thinking about how we come together across a global decentralized network of laboratories and organizations to try to do this, uh, pursue this mission of accelerating innovation um, and, and, and accelerating scientific discovery. And functionally, I, I run, I manage the uh, outreach uh, organization, which is about 20 to 30 people that really act as the interface between research and the rest of the company and the rest of the world. So we run the academic programs, uh, research collaborations with other institutions like uh, universities, for example. Um, we have a fellowship program, like you were talking about at the opening, where we provide talent pipelines. Um, and we also, again, work inside the company to develop those programs that uh, bring researchers together with, with more product-oriented folks to try to envision what those future opportunities are. So there's been a lot of forming, a lot of uh, kind of reinventing ourselves as an organization, uh, you know, thinking about how, uh, you know, where research is headed uh, in the future. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a little bit of a, of a glimpse. And every day is different, you know, just, just like with the previous job, which is part of, part of what I like about it. I can imagine. <laughs> um, Ashley, you know, one of the areas that, that you focused on a lot, um, you know, previously Microsoft was artificial intelligence. And this is something that we, we spent a lot of time uh, on the show about and talked about it from everything from uh, designing new drugs to, uh, to new flavors uh, of whiskeys. It, it seems like AI is showing up everywhere nowadays. Um, just as a sort of a, a, a side branch here, um, are there areas of artificial intelligence that you personally are most excited about looking forward? Obviously, it's going to probably be everywhere, <laughs> but are there specific applications of AI that we might not have, we might have to think off at the top of our heads that, wow, this, this might be a really great application uh, looking out the next five, 10 years? I, I really think applications of artificial intelligence that are more oriented towards human machine teaming, okay. I think are really exciting. Uh, the idea that uh, not only uh, do humans have to adapt to technologies, but technologies can understand uh, human beings a bit more and adapt to us. Uh, I'm really excited in particular about reinforcement learning, okay. uh, the idea that machines can learn for themselves in an environment just by interacting with an environment uh, in a way that's uh, inspired by, you know, the way that human beings learn as children to kind of interact with our world. Um, and again, to think about uh, methods for this uh, kind of uh, learning intelligent behaviors autonomously, greater autonomy for systems, but uh, that, are, that is intrinsically uh, human compatible, um, uh, responsible, some of those uh, you know, considerations that we're thinking about. So those are some of the areas that I find really exciting. I think applications of artificial intelligence that are geared towards more open world kinds of use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, driverless cars is, is, in ex, is a, I'll say, an illustrative example, although that's not something that I've worked on. Uh, but again, the idea that, you know, machine intelligence needs to generalize outside of gaming environments to take on more of the real world. And what is the role of a human being and human machine teaming and making machines capable of doing that, of helping us in these more open-ended applications? Um, so, so that's just a kind of, a, you know, view from what I'm excited about in my research. From, uh, you know, from a Microsoft research standpoint, one of the things that I'm incredibly excited about uh, is a new direction that uh, we have uh, in molecular simulation okay. or AI in, in terms of accelerating our ability to model phenomena at the molecular level. And so um, we've just made, uh, brought on Max Welling, who's a renowned uh, researcher in this area uh, and he's going to be working closely um, in the UK with the Microsoft Research Cambridge team. Mm. But you can imagine, um, you know, a lot of the uh, phenomena that happen at the molecular level are very difficult, uh, or take, they take very uh, a long time to simulate using first principles physics. Sure. Um, you know, it, phenomena on the order of microseconds can take, you know, tens of days, even maybe even hundreds of days for a supercomputer, uh, you know, to simulate, you know, through the first principles. We know how to do it through, you know, the first principles physics, but it can be really slow. And now you, you have, think about an application of machine learning mm -hmm. that could speed that up dramatically. Now, what could you do? You could, you could discover new therapeutics, uh, you know, new pharmaceuticals, drugs, you know, to, um, you know, to address some uh, you know, address illnesses uh, and disease in new ways. You could think about new uh, sustainable materials 
that you know could utilize less carbon to produce or even have a negative carbon effect. Um, so the idea that you know you could uh, you know you could utilize machine learning in an application like this to speed up uh, you know molecular simulation is is a really fascinating new angle. And again, just another example of uh, something really exciting uh, happening at Microsoft that's kind of uh, right at the forefront of research and ultimately thinking about, you know, again, being Microsoft, how we leverage advancements in this to empower, uh, you know, the technology community to, um, you know, to accelerate drug discovery, to mm -hmm. make materials more sustainable, et cetera. So ultimately creating tools that others can use. Wonderful. Um, you know, I, I like to joke that, you know, if, if we could just clone the, the Ashley Lorenz of the world, uh, 100, 500 times, whatever, most of the world's problems go away. Uh, obviously, we can't do that today yet, but we do have the next generation coming along. And obviously, I'm sure part of your outreach is, is exciting this next generation about uh, STEM uh, th through your outreach. Uh, talk a little bit about what you might be doing to, to get the, the kids out there, the high school students and so forth, further interested in this. And then um, us reconnecting to what we discussed earlier on, um, how uh, popular culture, hip hop, some of these uh, other paths may be ways to, to excite youth uh, into getting them focused on these areas nowadays. Absolutely. So I, over the course of my career, I've just tried to leverage my own story, uh, my two interests, my, my own pathway to inspire young people. And that's come in a variety of forms, uh, you know, speaking to audiences from uh, elementary school kids all the way to high school and college. Uh, I even took a trip back to my alma mater, uh, Urbana-Champaign, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, a few years ago to, um, to, to give uh, a lecture there to, uh, to some of the early, early career um, ECE students. So for me, that's a continuing personal passion. And I'm always thinking about ways that I can essentially share my story and my experiences. I think that's what really makes it real uh, for folks. It's hard to think about, especially when you're young, to think about these things in the abstract. You just need reference points, um, people that have gone through something, uh, people that you can relate to. Um, and to the extent that my particular experiences may be more relatable because of who I am or what I've done, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'd love to, to try to leverage that. Um, in my current role for outreach, uh, we definitely see the role of research is to inspire. And so that's, you know, everything from young people, even to our colleagues, uh, you know, in other parts of other parts of the company, uh, or even in companies that we might partner with. In terms of the actual outreach, our, our, um, our outreach tends to focus a little bit more right now at the graduate student level. Okay. So we talked about these, uh, we talked about these pipelines that we try to create. It's really amazing to see uh, all of the you know, support that we have going out uh, by way of the Microsoft Fellowship Program and actually uh, you know, assisting with tuition for students that are uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, that we identify through, uh, through our fellowship process. So, so that's really inspiring to see, to see Microsoft supporting in that way. And I think as we, as we try to expand that mission and diversify you know, the outreach, um, we, you may even see us doing, uh, uh, doing things a little differently and thinking about even uh, support at the baccalaureate level or ways mm -hmm. that we can reach uh, even before grad school. So that's, uh, those are some of the things we're doing now for outreach, you know, focused on those uh, you know, rising stars in their field and then some of the things we're thinking about as we think about how to even expand and diversify from there. Excellent. And, you know, actually you had a, uh, a fascinating uh, trip to date in terms of uh, academia, private industry, entrepreneurship. Uh, you've worked in science and tech, you, you've worked in entertainment. Um, I want to sort of give the floor back to you just for a couple of minutes. Um, I obviously have this part where we ask about mentors, influencers, people that have been there with you along uh, for the ride that have kept you on this path. Uh, take some time to, to mention, shout out to some of the more important mentors uh, that have uh, really been there with you on this amazing career? Mm. Yeah, it's such a great question. And, and mentors play uh, such an important role. You know, it, going early in my career, like high school, uh, I had a math teacher, Mr. Amaro, that was really uh, influential. And he really, between him and my dad, you know, being a, being a high school math teacher, really ignited, you know, ignited a passion for me in, in mathematics. 
And we would even come early to school, early bird, like 6.30 or 7 o'clock or something like that to do, you know, learn linear algebra. And that's something that stood out to me in particular uh, because linear algebra is such a foundation uh, sure. for a lot of what we do and uh, machine learning and pattern recognition, matrix math. And it was, it was striking to me that in our spare time, uh, we had learned so much linear algebra that I actually didn't see a lot of new math until halfway through my college career, um, you know, which was, uh, you know, pretty, uh, you know, very helpful in my engineering curriculum. Getting to uh, early in my career at Johns Hopkins, um, Scott Peacock was the person that hired me sure. uh, in, uh, got me in as an intern and then hired me full time. Uh, and I really feel I learned to be a professional engineer under Scott. And so, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was very influential in that way. You know, everything from, you know, uh, ways of thinking about solving problems to a lot of the professional ethics and ethos, you know, that kind of go into being an engineer. Mm -hmm. And so that was, you know, he was, a, uh, he was a great mentor as well. And of course, there are, you know, just many people along the way. Uh, I try to learn from everyone. Uh, you know, in different ways. I feel when I meet people, everyone can have something to teach you. Many times it'll be an example of what to do. Sometimes it, it, it can be a sharing of a lesson learned. So thank goodness we don't all have to make the same mistakes. We can learn from each other's mistakes. Uh, and so at, at any rate, I, I think it's such an important question. There have been so many mentors. Some of them are, you know, have been uh, shared aspects of my identity and shared aspects of, of my, uh, my story. And other of, uh, others are just completely different, uh, you know, in terms of the experiences that they've had, in terms of the way that they identify as a person, and yet, uh, you know, have been so influential. So I think it's just important to be able to, um, you know, to learn from the people in your life like that. Outstanding. Outstanding. Um, actually, the final question here, and then as uh, people that uh, watch the show know I typically give the bio uh, of our guests to my kids uh, to see if there's anything uh, interesting that they come up with. And um, I had to listen to the beginning of a, an interview that you did with Microsoft's uh, Chief Technology Officer, Kevin Scott, uh, where that you mentioned uh, amongst your early interests in science and technology, you were also very interested in comic books and you're a big fan of the Infinity One series. <laughs> And so the questions that my daughter and son came up with, um, and these are tough ones, uh, A, your favorite superhero, <laughs> and this is a little tougher one, uh, if you had to choose one of the Infinity Gauntlet gems, uh, specifically out of the Infinity Gauntlet, which one do you would choose? Uh, and I'll hand you that one, and it's a tough set of questions there. <laughs> you know, my, my favorite uh, comic book character growing up was Silver Surfer. Oh, okay. Very good. All right. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting because when you look at the, 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 the MCU, as it's currently formulated, Marvel yep. Comics, uh, you know, cinematic sure. universe, um, it, Silver Surfer doesn't play a big role, which was, you know, and I'm a big fan of the MCU, but I've always kind of missed the Silver Surfer. I think this has something to do with the way that the different properties are owned by studios. Yep. I think that you know, the Fantastic Four and the Silver Surfer are kind of yep. owned by a different studio. But, um, you know, in the, in the original Infinity Gauntlet series, Silver Surfer actually played a big role and was one of my favorites and one of my dad's favorites. This was uh, something that my dad and I kind of did together. Um, in the original Infinity Gauntlet series, um, the Soul Gem played a really big role. Sure. And in another character that's not so much in the MCU, Adam Warlock played a big role. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, at the risk of spoiling the comic books, which I don't know if that's really a thing, <laughs> if people should go back. No, and we have it. them all here. That's yeah, okay. right, right. But, you know, at the, the, the way that the battle is won, right, is that, I, and I think this is true, it's been a while, so take this with a grain of salt. But I, I think I remember, you know, Adam Warlock kind of having been trapped in the Soul Gym yeah. uh, and sort of coming out of the Soul Gym and then, you know, essentially taking the, the gauntlet from Thanos. So, yeah. Uh, that's, you know, that's one of my favorite moments. And those were some of the characters that I enjoyed from the original series. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I, I love any character that wields the power of cosmic. So I'm all yes. with you with, with the silver. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Um, actually this is, this is really very fascinating and I just really appreciate the, the time you took 
to talk to us today. I really want to wish you the best on this journey. I know it's going to be very extremely exciting and successful. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening to, to this particular episode on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to Ashley Lorenz, Vice President, Distinguished Scientist, and Managing Director at Microsoft Research Outreach. Uh, also check out his, uh, uh, his hip-hop label and Solstice. Um, Ashley, once again, I want to thank you for taking the time to come out of your uh, out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Thanks for everything you're doing there. And as we say on our show, uh, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow through everything you're doing. Very inspiring story. Really appreciate the um, the time today, Ira. Pleasure to be here. <laughs>